Baruch Hashem, great to be back in the Tanya. And we mentioned yesterday we started talking about God's unity. One of the best topics in the world to talk about because it's so real. And like we mentioned yesterday that we're hardcore monotheists, which means that not just that there's one God in the category of God, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff like, you know, plexiglass and Pepsi bottle, the bottle's still here. And, uh, you know, all sorts of other things happening, but rather God is one. There's nothing but God. We're all inside of God right now. So that's a little bit more hardcore. And the more you meditate on that, the, actually the happier your life becomes because you really feel that you're part of something and you're not separate, you're not divorced from your source. And it's actually, if you really get that point, it's the secret to all of true happiness. All lasting happiness is that I'm completely connected to God and there's nothing great, there's nothing more invigorating than that, than having a real authentic connection. And that comes from knowing that God is one. That I'm, I can't be separate except in my perspective. And therefore once I shift my perspective back to God consciousness, that there's nothing but Hashem, that is a way to invigorate a person in a very, very deep way. Okay? Now, we mentioned yesterday also that God thinks in a different way, so to speak, that God, His ability to know something and the subject of the knowledge is all one thing, but with us it's three different things. That was something we talked about yesterday. And that concept, I'm going to be back in the Tanya now, right now. We cannot fully grasp this idea because beyond this, because we don't think this way. We have me, the Pepsi bottle, and my ability to know what a Pepsi bottle is. Those are three different faculties. God, however, is different because there's God, there's the creation, and his ability to know the creation is all one thing. It's nothing but a Shem. And now the Balatanya brings a few proofs to this, like it says in the scriptures, can you receive a cheker aloika timza? That somebody can fully figure out God, you will find? Exclamation mark, question mark. I think they call it a terabang. Am I correct with that? That's way too academic for me. But uh, we just say it with the emphasis. Timza, you will find such a person? The answer is no. And that we mentioned a few days ago, that if a person says, oh yeah, I know God, I know everything about Him. So what do you do if somebody says that to you? You run away, we told you that. Run far away in the opposite direction. Because you cannot find somebody that fully has worked out God, because then He would be God. And we are different, but Hashem gives us a path to make a relationship with Him. But not that we can fully figure Him out fully. Okay? Like Rabbi Burgess famously said, what's the first commandment? I am God. What's the second commandment? Or in other words, and you're not. <laughs> and it's not you. <laughs> I am God and it's not you. <laughs> so that's fine. We're happy with that. We're, we're ha Once you know your space in the relationship, now you can make a relationship. Now there's a relationship to be had, to be formed, to be, to be made. And the next verse says, Ki loy shavoy, say shavoy, And not are my thoughts, says God, your thoughts, meaning I think differently. Hashem and His thoughts are one. Hashem is not different than His thoughts, whereas me and my thoughts are different. That's very important to know also on a practical growth-oriented way, which is that you and your thoughts are different. If I were to just take a moment and put this in, 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 as a parenthetic point, a lot of times people find that when they have bad thoughts, they get really down because they start defining themselves by their thoughts. Like, oh, I just keep having these like bummed out thoughts. And I'm like, like those negative thoughts. And I just can't, I can't get my mind out of the gutter. And so I guess, you know, I have bad thoughts, so I'm bad. I had these thoughts, so I must be a loser. But wait a second. We're showing right now that your thoughts are not you. They're separate from you. They express something that's going on, but it's not you. It's like clothing regarding your body. Are your clothing you? No. They're not you. Even though the world might tell you, clothes make the man. Well, they do define certain parts about what you're, what's going on with you, but they're not you. They're not you. You're much deeper than your clothing, and you're much deeper than your thoughts. You're the soul. The thoughts are something more external to you. 
So, but Hashem is different because Hashem and His thoughts are one. That's one of the reasons why learning Torah, which we're going to get to in the time, is one of the most powerful things you could do. Because what is the Torah? Anyone, anyone who doesn't know, when we say Torah, it's just like a, you know, it's just, it's the same thing as Torah. But it's just like Ashkenazi and Torah. So when you learn Torah, what are you doing? What is, first of all, what is Torah? It's also that, it's God's thoughts. It's God's thoughts. So when, and Hashem and His thoughts are what? One. So when you're actually learning Torah, you're learning God's thoughts, which means you're actually dealing with Hashem Himself. And the most amazing thing about Torah is that it's written in a way that's relatable, because we're talking about stuff that's in this world, like animals and you know, people stealing things and what to do. And Hashem is speaking about how to respond, which means those are His thoughts and that's His will. And Hashem and His thoughts and His will are one. So when you're learning Torah, especially the deeper part of Torah, you're literally encountering God. That's why we're so Meshuggah about Torah. Mm-hmm. Yes? As a thought, if we're a thought, how can we how can we encounter Hashem's thoughts? As a thought, how can a thought think about thoughts? We're, so to speak, we're a little bit different because our we're coming into the world through breath, like we mentioned, and through thought. But that is all a system of Simpson, it's a system of Hashem concealing, where we have now free will, because there's been concealments. Hashem blocks the light, but then He gives us a way to trace ourselves back to deeper thoughts. That's the Torah. That's why, we, what do we say? Kushabricha Yisrael ve'araisacha. You're right. Yisrael and the Torah and Hashem is one. In a certain way, yeah, you're just returning to yourself. The Torah is you. And is Hashem, and is you. It's all one. Therefore, yeah, you're right. When you're learning it, you're just getting in touch with yourself, which is God. It's Hashem. It's the Torah. It's you. It's all one thing. Yichad, Dan, you got that? It's all one thing. It's you. It's the Torah. It's Hashem. It's all one thing. So if you're hanging out, I don't know, watching Netflix, then you're you're. You're less in touch with yourself, God, and the Torah. Because those are not, that's not the essential thoughts of God, or the essential will. Those are the ways that Hashem makes free will come into being. That He says, either you could binge on this, or you could shift to find out my undiluted will. The only reason there's going to be reward and punishment is that there's another option. Either I could have followed Hashem's will, or I could go the other direction. That's why we give a child a reward when he chooses to do something and he had another choice to do something else. When the child chooses to do the will, let's say his higher will, or to do something that's, uh, when a person had the ability to do something selfish, or he shared with somebody. You know, he could have, there's always these cute videos, like the, the, he had like, you know, a couple dollars and he could have bought him like a two scoop ice cream cone, but he there was someone homeless and he gave them, you know, a one scoop ice cream and he also had a one scoop. So there, there was another option. It's, it's, and it's cute and it's precious and we love that because it's really speaking about something deep. Why do we feel good when he did that? Because he could have not done that. If he had no desire to have a two scoop ice cream cone, would we have any endearment for that boy? No, he'd be like a robot. There'd be nothing to it. Two, pardon the pun. But once he could have had two, and then he saw somebody in need, and he gave them a one scoop, and he also had a one scoop, we feel that something, a choice was made to align with something more real, more true, more emes, more... Because, of course, that's a mitzvah from the Torah, which is gimelus chasad, it's chesed, v'ahav l'recha k'maycha. And therefore, when you do that, you're aligning with reality more. The more you learn Torah, the more you're aligning with reality. The more you learn Torah, the more you're aligning with reality. So I want to just speak about this a little bit, which is we don't fully have the ability to understand this, like we mentioned. 
that Hashem is one because we operate differently. For example, we have different limbs. We have different senses. We have eyes, well, Hashem, our eyes work. We have ears, we have a nose. Our eyes see things. Our ears hear things. When was the last time that you saw, you know, I don't know, a two-pack song? You don't, because your ears hear it, and your eyes see things. When was the last time you heard the Mona Lisa? So the answer is, I never did, because my, my ears don't hear a Mona Lisa, my eyes see the Mona Lisa. So in the world, in the world of our senses and our body, we have certain faculties that do certain things and other faculties that do other things. And they don't cross lines. The, the wires don't cross. Except, as you might remember at Mount Sinai, where we actually saw the sounds and we heard the sights. And it wasn't a mushroom trip. It was real. And the reason for that is, is because we went above the five senses and therefore the senses started to blend together. Eyes no longer needed to just see things. They can also hear things. But generally, when we walk around, in our experience, you and I, right now, 2020, moving into 21, we see things with our eyes. That's just straightforward. We hear things with our ears. We walk with our feet. We don't walk with our nose. It'd be kind of weird and uncomfortable. It means the realm of certain things stay in certain places, and they're designated as such. God is not like that. He doesn't have designated things that do one thing and not the other. He's completely beyond any definition. He is one. Like we keep emphasizing, he's one. There's no multiplicity. So then how do I, as somebody that's so split up, and the Der Hashem talks about this in the beginning of Der Hashem, the Ramchal, that we have a faculty of imagination, we have a faculty of taste, we have a faculty of, of, of memory, these are different parts of us. They're all part of my brain. They're all part of me. But they're different chambers. They're different limbs that do different things. But God's different than that. He is all of them as one. It's called Achtus Pshuta. Complete, simple unification. So then how do we relate to Hashem? If the way that we experience the world is through different senses, and Hashem's realm is one. The answer is, my friends, there's one chush. There's one part of us that is able to experience complete undiluted godliness, and that's called the soul. Because the soul is not limited by hearing and seeing and memory and taste and my feet and my arms and my belly button, and my nose. The soul transcends all of that. And therefore the soul becomes a medium that I can encounter Hashem. And therefore, to the degree that I start to tune into my soul, I'm able to make contact, so to speak, with Hashem. You're right, in the realm of a multiplicity, a world of just, of, of, of hands and eyes and feet and etc. What's the song my kids are singing now? Head and shoulders, knees and toes. It's very sweet. The kids got to learn their thing. And my younger daughter's like learning about her ears and they bring home ear things and they, they wear the little clapper thing. And, and one day all the girls walked out of their gun with whistles, 30 girls with a whistle. <laughs> I'll tell you, you could hear the whistles around the whole community. It was, uh, it was loud. Especially in the house. Daddy, look at it. Okay, thank you. My ears are working. Baal Hashem. I'm very thankful that, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, so we learn about these faculties, but we have to know that when we speak about Hashem, we want to somehow attach ourselves to the unity of Hashem. That's called your soul. Your soul will be the way to make contact with Hashem. Okay? Now, I want to just read one more line in Tanya. Now, all of this, I'm just going to summarize, was to teach us that Hashem and His thoughts and everything about Hashem is one. 
And what did we say before? The source of the soul is coming from Hashem's thoughts. That's how we began the chapter. He, so to speak, just like a father gives birth to a son, that the seed of the child starts in the mind of the father. We said this is for mature audiences. So too, when it comes to Hashem, He, so to speak, birthed through His thoughts the soul. Okay? Now, what's especially unique and special about that is when it comes to a child of flesh and blood, so the thoughts of the father and the father are deeply, intimately bound up together. And therefore, the child will have a deep connection to the father. But the thoughts of the father and the father are not one, literally, but they're very close. However, when we talk about a sham in his thoughts, they are literally one. You cannot separate between Hashem and His thoughts. And therefore, when we talk about Hashem birthing the godly soul, it's literally God, undiluted, so to speak. Or at least the closest thing. One notch down. Okay? Because Hashem and His thoughts are one. So far, so good. The Balatanya is now going to ask a difficulty based on that, which is, if all of the souls are one with Hashem, and they all come from the same location of God's thoughts, shouldn't all the souls be equal? If they all come from Hashem's unbounded unity, shouldn't all the souls be the same? What he's going to teach us is that all, not all souls seem to be equal. Look what he says. Look inside. Va'af. That word va'af means uh, there's a problem. Even though there are tens of thousands, he really means up to 600,000 and more, different levels of neshamas. Gevoya al gevoya. Higher and higher, next page, la'em kates, without limit. He doesn't mean actually without limit, he means basically for all intents and purposes, there's higher and higher and higher and higher souls. So you'll think, well, who are you talking about? Well, he'll say, <laughs> Like the souls of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were on another level. If Abraham walked into this room, we'd fall over. We'd fall over with holiness. And Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe was on another level when he was born. The whole house filled with light. His soul was a very exalted soul. Al, which is more, those were higher souls. Those are more spiritual souls. Al, more than Nishmais Doire Senu Eila, more than our generation. And look at the Bible Times is going to call our generation. Pay close attention. The Ikfisa de Meshicha. The Balatanya already said 200 plus years ago that the souls of his generation were already the footsteps of Mashiach, the heel of Mashiach. Which means if that generation was the heel of Mashiach, we're like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the foot of the dead skin of the athlete's foot of the bottom of the foot. Literally, the toe fungus. We're like the right at the bottom of this foot. Yeah, don't get so down. We're right at the bottom. I'm, I'm going to teach you guys how the bottom of the foot is actually not as bad as you think it is. It's going to be the greatest level. It's going to be actually the most exalted level because it's actually the level that's touching the earth. It's, the, it's bringing everything all the way down. And it's the level that the, the bottom of the foot is generally the most dead skin. You can even put a pin into the bottom of that heel. You barely feel it. You put a pin somewhere like closer to the higher levels, it's like very sensitive. The bottom of the foot is dead. So what's a greater, what's greater? Let, let, let me just phrase it like this. And you're gonna, we're gonna use this imagery. There's a deliberate reason why I'm using this imagery now. And you're gonna understand the next few days why we're using this imagery. Where's the action at? In my head or the bottom of my foot? Action? Your head. If I'm making Kiddush, I'm excited about something. Where's the action at? Your head. My head. I'm having a, a scintillating conversation with somebody. 
Where's the action that made my head, made my heart? Is the action at the bottom of my feet? No, no. if the bottom of my feet would, be, would see me in the middle of this nice conversation with somebody, it would look up and say, no, like, what's going on up there? Like, let me in on this. It's kind of like dull down here. Interesting to note, the bottom of the foot is the only location of your body that it could be completely sunny outside. It's the only place that never will receive the light of the sun. It's covered over. It's dark. It's interesting. All the sun in the world could be shining on you. It's a place that's completely the lowest place. So let me phrase it like this. What, what amazes me more? That my mind can get excited about something? Or that the bottom of my foot, I'm talking conceptually now, the bottom of my foot, which is the most dead skin, that the dead, the lowest part of me could come to life, is that more impressive? Or is that my head, which is already fired up, gets excited? What's more impressive? What's more amazing? That the bottom of my foot, which is basically dead, could come to life? That's what we call the resurrection of the dead. That the lowest part of you, the part of you that doesn't feel very much, that's very uns that's totally numb to spiritualness, could come alive. That part to come alive is awesome. So the earlier generations, like the patriarchs, the matriarchs, Moses, that they were inspired about God, of course they were. They're from the higher place. But the lower generations, the heel, for us to be inspired is going to take a little bit more. And the Balatani said that was already 200 years ago. But let's frame it now, all back to us, which is, if we all come from the thought of God, which is one, why would there ever be different souls that shouldn't make any sense because we all should be the same. But we see not like that. We see that there's differences. There's actually souls that are higher, let's call them more spiritually sensitive, and souls that are coarser, that are less spiritual. Sometimes you meet a guy and you just talk, you start talking to him about God. He's like, oh my goodness. I, 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 I'm, yeah, I get it. And you, sometimes you talk to another person and you're like, so, like, you know, you know Hashem made the world. He's like, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken? No, like, like who's making Kentucky Fried Chicken right now? Like, he's, who's creating Kentucky Fried Chicken from nothingness into actualness every second? Uh, so when are we eating it? I'm hungry. But you just ate, like, a whole bucket of it. Like, well, maybe we should learn about where life comes from. Uh, so we're not getting Kentucky Fried Chicken? We're getting Wendy's? <laughs> Mickey D's? And you're thinking, you know, I, I want to just help. I want to have a conversation. Let's, let, let, let's talk. So there are certain people that are more spiritually in tune. And there's nothing necessarily that bad with KFC, besides the fact that it's probably going to clog the arteries. And... And it's not kosher. And to, to learn to become sensitive, there's, there's a difference. There's a difference. Isn't that and, the difference usually the good? The, well, oh, so you're already getting into the answer. But we're asking a question, which is that even in the quality of the soul, it seems like there's differences. There's higher souls and there's lower souls. So how are we going to answer that? I thought we just said they all come from God and his thoughts, which are one with God. They should all be the same. How are we going to answer that quandary? We'll pick up with that tomorrow. Yes, sir. I have a wonderful evening.